how do you follow that? <laughs> I don't know. What I'm sitting here thinking is I want my whiskey and cigar back in my monster truck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was, she was talking about uh, the poverty and the police state. We're at this point where we, we almost treat poverty as if it's a disease. We have to stop treating poverty and start spreading prosperity. And there's a difference. The free market has always been the fuel for freedom. Always. If you look at captive slaves in ancient Egypt, free enterprise is what fuel freedom. If you look at revolutions in Russia and China and here, free enterprise is always fuel freedom. So it's, it's definitely an important message to get back to a model of free enterprise, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But before I introduce our next guest, because we're a little bit ahead, I had this quick story about the police state that she reminded me of. Uh, I host a show. And the show airs in all 50 states, uh, largest markets in New York City. So a lot of people hear the show. And I was going off on the TSA one day. And I said, you know, these are basically the people who you wouldn't hire for fast food. These are Burger King rejects. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm in an airport. And uh, I'm headed to give a speech. And I'm going through the TSA line. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm opting to do the pat down thing instead of the other thing. And, I made it through the line and taking my stuff out of the bag. And this lady walks up to me and she says, Burger King reject, huh? <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> but, so this is my little, my little police day story. It, 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 it ended fine because I had a microphone and a camera and everything. But yeah. <laughs> All right, our next, our next speaker is one that I'm actually excited. It's uh, excited here. It's the only one on the on TS today that I haven't actually heard, so I'm excited about it. Her name is Karen Strang. And is she here? Karen, come on down. Completely different 
political entities, radical Islam and progressive feminism, they're doing the exact same thing. They're punishing somebody for presenting an idea that's considered taboo. Here in the West, the dominant paradigm leans to the left. Uh, it uh, favors progressivism, feminism, socialism, egalitarianism, sexual freedom, environmentalism, and diversity. And it's thought terminating conversation ending cliches reflect those paradigms. But accusatory words like racist, homophobe, sexist, misogynist, overprivileged white male, rape apologist, woman hater, Neanderthal, right wing nut, and even climate change denier are really little different from words that express the exact same human dynamic 500 years ago. Heretic, infidel, blasphemer, heathen, apostate, witch. Correct words and ideas are stolen by the establishment, incorrect ones are censured or banned. And what is generally thought of as a means by which governments and formal institutions can curtail freedom of thought and more easily control society. Uh, here in the West, it's morphed into kind of a multi-headed hydra, attacking ideas from the top down, the bottom up, and playing all ends against the middle. One of its primary feeding and breeding grounds right now in the U.S. and Canada is on the typical university campus where administrators, whether intentionally or unwittingly, uh, students' unions and student social justice warriors have created a kind of perfect storm of thought suppression in the very realm of our society supposedly devoted to freedom of thought and the free exchange of ideas. In November of 2012, author and psychologist Warren Barrett was invited by CAFE, Canadian Association for Equality to speak at the University of Toronto. Among Farrell's credentials are his election twice to the board of the New York chapter of the National Organization for Women. Uh, he's been, his books have been featured in Oprah's book club list, and uh, he was named by the Financial Times as one of the world's top 100 thought leaders. Uh, he runs regular workshops for couples to help them communicate better and Frankly, he's about the most polite, kind, and soft-spoken man you could ever hope to meet. The only problem was that the topic of his talk was the boy crisis. He planned to address the high rates of male suicide across the West, three to four times that of girls and young women, uh, the growing failure to launch phenomenon among young men, and falling levels of male educational attainment. And then there's the dire sin of his daring to question feminism's assertion that men as a class had always oppressed women as a class. Campus social justice warriors, in conjunction with the university's women's studies department, student union, and the local chapter of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, set up a human barricade at the doors to block attendees from getting inside the building. They openly claimed they were there to shut down an event that was promoting patriarchy, whatever that means. Uh, they claimed that some of Farrell's research findings were misogynistic. His, his research findings were misogynistic. So empirical facts are misogynistic. They verbally bullied, harassed, assaulted, and abused several attendees who were pulled to the side by police for their own protection. And when the police intervened to remove the human barricade, uh, so attendees could enter, the protesters turned their hostility on police, uh, some of them committing assault. All to prevent the discussion on why young men commit suicide so much more often than young women do, and why they're increasingly flunking out of school, and why they're experiencing a growing reluctance to grow up and take on the responsibilities of adults. Since then, CAFE has sponsored other events at universities in Ontario, Ryerson, where I spoke, uh, the University of Toronto again, the University of Ottawa, and Queen's University, to speak about the problems facing men and boys in our culture and to criticize feminism's sexist double standards. Many of these talks were disrupted by protesters who turned lights on and off, pulled fire alarms, shouted through bullhorns while banging. Uh, just outside the lecture hall doors. And in one most recent case, Professor Janet Theomango's talk was shut down 
when protesters attended and interrupted her by banging on desks, chanting, singing, and yelling through bullhorns every time she opened her mouth to speak. Prominent American civil rights attorney Marty Silvergate bemoans the new culture on North American campuses. As a young, idealistic student at Harvard, he participated in the free speech movement, and he laments what he calls the Harvard bait and switch, that so many of the liberals who fought so hard for free speech when they were students have flip-flopped in attitude now that they are running the schools. He's in the unenviable position of being a staunch liberal who feels compelled to defend the rights of conservative students, pro-life students, Christian and traditionalist students, through his work with the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, uh, an organization that he founded. Not because he agrees with their politics, but because they are now the ones whose voices are being marginalized by the politically correct establishment. It is the nature of power that seeks to preserve itself, and one of the best ways to do that is to silence any dissent, uh, suppress free speech and thought. Unlike many people these days, I refuse to blame this tendency or implicate specifically any one ideology. This is not, again, just a problem with the political left. Uh, it's a repressive and abusive behavior that is just as common in highly conservative institutions when conservatism is the dominant paradigm. Political correctness is not a problem with any ideology. It's just an ideology problem and a human problem. And it will always be the political underdogs who most highly value freedom of thought and expression. As a vocal anti-feminist, yes, I'm one of the bad people, uh, whose current place of business is YouTube. I'm extremely concerned about the idea that uh, an institution that builds itself as a place to exchange ideas and thoughts uh, might place unreasonable or biased limits on what is said in their venue. One of the more insidious developments in recent years uh, has been the shifting of the ideological battlefield away from arenas where free speech is guaranteed and uh, into the private sector, into corporations that control what we see. Um, while governments and free societies have to tolerate freedom of speech, even speech they don't like, privately owned businesses are uniquely vulnerable to threats to their bottom line and exempt from anti-censorship laws. Last year, the feminists launched a media campaign to draw attention to misogynistic pages on Facebook. Admittedly, some of those pages pretty awful, uh, glorifying violence against women and promoting hate. Mortified by all of the negative publicity, Facebook agreed to allow feminist consultants who were experts in spotting misogyny uh, to train their community standards staff on how better to moderate uh, their community. In the months that followed, a lot of misogynistic pages came down, uh, but caught up in the anti-misogyny sweep were pages whose only sin was to publish uh, government statistics on domestic violence or to draw attention to uh, crimes and harmful behaviors most commonly committed by women, things like infanticide or paternity fraud. Allowed to stand for months, however, were pages dedicated to male genocide. So you can see how these rules are so evenly applied. Uh, also, pages devoted to discussing how all men are pigs. And while I'm no fan of censorship, either by government or private entities, what is good for the goose ought to be good for the gander. Uh, but in the world of gender politics, that's just never how it plays out. A year or two ago, Walmart was called on the carpet by outraged social justice warriors for marketing t-shirts to little girls, teenage girls, that claimed, I'm too pretty to do homework, so I made my brother do it for me. This was a sexist, misogynist shirt, and it had to go. Uh, remaining on the shelves was a plethora of merchandise with the, uh, the claim, boys are stupid, throw rocks at them. Okay? 
That brand is still widely available at most major retailers, uh, just in case you wanted to know. And maybe throw some rocks. Similarly, a campaign was recently launched, this was just lately in the news, uh, on Twitter to pressure Comedy Central to cancel the Colbert Report over a satirical tweet uh, that used racism against Asian Americans to lampoon Dan Snyder, owner of the Redskins, over his suggestion that he could open a foundation for original Americans rather than change the racist name of his team. Colbert, of course, tweet read, I am willing to show you the Asian community I care by introducing the Changchong Ding Dong Foundation for Sensitivity to Orientals or whatever. <laughs> Stupid things racists say, okay? Um, keep in mind the tweet was lampooning Dan Snyder, not Asian Americans. It was ridiculing racism and racists, not any given race. But social justice warriors pitched up their pitch pitchforks and sally forth. Apologies abounded, the tweet was removed, and yet somehow these warriors only got angrier. As Harvey Silvergate has said, free speech for me, but not for these, seems to be the way things play out. And while Stephen Colbert might be a big enough cash cow for Comedy Central to be willing to weather this internet tempest in a teacup, or a tweet cup, I guess, uh, not everyone who speaks against the status quo has the luxury of being worth a lot of money to the people who decide what you get to hear. Um, you know, I am a big enough name on YouTube that they are willing to actually put human eyes on the case when my channel gets flagged for hate speech or my channel gets flagged for bullying or a violation of privacy. Uh, they will actually have somebody look at that. But in a, the case of a smaller channel with fewer subscribers and isn't making YouTube a ton of money, uh, they have just an automated system that will, you know, three strikes, you're gone. Right? Your channel's down, all your videos are gone. <laughs> Another case in point, uh, last year, Justin Bakula, a prominent member of the atheist skeptic community, was forced to resign his position as head of his chapter of the Secular Coalition for America because he had the temerity to be skeptical about feminist claims of rampant sexual harassment and sexual assault of women at their conferences. Uh, you heard me, a leader of the skeptic community uh, you know, a community that bases itself on being skeptical unless there's proof, uh, had to resign from a prominent position in his community because he refused to accept a vague, ephemeral, ephemeral claim, unsubstantiated claims of rampant rape and sexual harassment going on in his community. He was fired for being too skeptical. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> The methods by which his enemies coerced him into stepping down included harassment, slander, libel, employment, blacklisting, and an organized letter writing campaign to his parents, who they publicly doxed, to tell them what a horrible misogynistic son they raised. Uh, another similar case involved a father of four in Toronto named Gregory Allen Elliott. He offered his services as a graphic designer to an organization called Women in Toronto Politics. Uh, which was founded by outspoken feminist Steph Guthrie. Uh, this is how much he's pro-feminist. He volunteered his services as a graphic designer to a feminist organization. Where he went wrong <clears throat> was in criticizing Guthrie and her friends over Twitter uh, for their current and planned real-life harassment of another man whose legal actions they disapproved of a game developer who had created a satirical crude and vulgar game app targeting another feminist's ideas. The three women in the case made public the game developer's real name and the address and other identifying information tweeted to every software company in the area to not hire the misogynist and were planning to poster his hometown with evidence of his many, many misogynistic sins, which was basically disagreeing with feminists. Gregory Allen Elliott told them over Twitter that he disapproved of their vengeful mentality and their harassment of this man, who had done nothing illegal. 
uh, and who had clearly explained at the start of his game act that the game was satirical, it was, it was the way it was for a reason, and this was his way of protesting. Okay? Elliot is currently on trial for criminal harassment. Steph Guthrie and her friends claim that they were terrified by his tweeting at them that he disapproved of their actions. And so now he is actually facing a charge of criminal harassment. And uh, then, interestingly enough, an acquaintance of theirs just the other week uh, violated judicial protocol, wrote directly to the judge that these women had conspired to make a public example of Mr. Guff, uh, Mr. Elliot through manipulation of the criminal justice system. The judge has ordered these allegations to be investigated. I have read those tweets, nothing threatening in them, and you can tell that there is no way those women were terrified in any way of Mr. Elliot. This uproar is, uh, is, is, is just, it, it's inconceivable to me that a person can face jail time for tweeting, you're not a nice person, at somebody. The other day, in my hometown, radio station 630 Chet was forced to pull an opinion poll and apologize to our local professional umbrage takers. Their diagram was that after a news piece quoted Edmonton City Police as saying victim blaming was still all too common in cases of sexual assault, uh, Chet put out a poll to find out just how common it is. They asked their listeners, do you feel a victim of sexual assault is in any way responsible for what happened? Yes or no? Uh, the uproar that ensued is a bit of a head scratcher. Um, if, if it wasn't offensive to have Edmonton Police Services say people still victim blame in cases of sexual assault, how on earth could it be offensive for a radio station to try to determine how prevalent that behavior is in our society? But daring to even ask the question is offensive, so offensive that they were forced to apologize. They pulled the pole and they're still under heavy media fire. So the story, it, it happens over and over again. The story, the op-ed, the tweet, it gets pulled, the offender apologizes like there was no tomorrow, often to no avail. Ask Larry Summers what good his several apologies did for him. He was still out of a job as president of Harvard six months after. Uh, you know, in fact, I think apologizing was his first mistake. Uh, the outrage over his hypothesis was not grounded in any kind of reason or logic, right? Or even any kind of, you know, adherence to just the facts or, you know, whatever. It, it, was, it was pure irrational emotion. It was so raw that a female professor in the audience at his talk claimed later, completely sincerely, that when she realized what she was hearing, she literally felt like she was going to throw up, right? It's, it's a knee-jerk emotional reaction. Summer's hypothesis, one of three he presented as possible reasons women do not achieve at the extreme high end of ability in math and physics as often as men do, was that because men have a flatter distribution curve on a number of traits, including intelligence, there are simply more men than women at both ends of the curve. In other words, there are more male idiots than female idiots, and there are more male geniuses than female geniuses. There is nothing untrue or unreasonable in that statement, uh, yet it was interpreted by the media and by all of the people who took offense as him saying, men are smarter and better at math and physics. That was their interpretation of what he had said. Nobody, of course, went to the other end and said, he's claiming that men are stupider than women because no, no one would be offended by anyone claiming that. <laughs> so, um, you know, like, this, this is really hilarious. I mean, they, they, they don't, even, they're not even offended at what he said, right? They're offended at what he felt that he was implying, sort of, because I wasn't really listening to this, you know, the moment he opened his mouth, I just, my ears shut off. Right. Circumstances are even worse in Europe. Some examples from the last couple of years in the UK include a young man being charged with a crime for calling a policeman's horse gay. 
Uh, also, an elderly woman was arrested for shouting outside a mosque that Muslims should fit in or go back where they came from, only blocks away from a spot where a fundamentalist imam was daily preaching jihad to pastors by unmolested by the police. Okay, so again, one standard for me, another for me. Uh, Eight-year-old woman is arrested for saying, if you don't like it, I just, it doesn't make any sense. A recent proposal for a bill rep, uh, presented to the European Union suggested codifying something called group libel in its legislation. Laid out a scheme by which any negative ridiculing or mocking speech against any identifiable group of people and stated groups <laughs> included religions, races, ethnicities, and feminism would be an actionable, uh, actionable offense in a court of law. Right? You could actually be sued for saying the word feminazi. Uh, you know, in Sweden, political pundits have suggested making anti-feminist speech criminal, criminalizing it. Not just actionable in a civil court, but criminal. And in, in Spain, they recently passed an act that officially declares femicide, defined as the killing of any woman by any man to be a unique and special crime that uh, su that suffers stiffer penalties, subject to stiffer penalties than any other type of homicide. And uh, if the European Union were to accept group libel as a valid concept, uh, speaking against that feminist-inspired law would be illegal. <clears throat> the most horrifying thing I have observed in my four years of picking apart and criticizing political and scholarly feminism is the willingness of those who des desire to control the discourse to silence and marginalize dissenting voices and criticism. In this way, the feminist movement is no different from any other totalitarian ideology. Uh, however, they have a weapon more effective than any religion or communist government. They claim to represent women. Therefore, any criticism leveled against them can be construed as criticism of women or damaging to women. And we're just not that rational when it comes to things that harm women. We have a knee-jerk response to anything, any ill that befalls women. Uh, we have a Violence Against Women Act at the federal level to protect the safest demographic in our society, the demographic least likely to experience violence, have their own federal act. And in demographics, I'm including children. The radicals are the loudest and, uh, you know, and the most influential voices and the silent majority too often remain silent even when they might otherwise want to speak. Uh, when they do speak, they end up, like self-described equity feminist Christina Hoff Summers, listed in the anti-feminism section of Feminism's Wikipedia page, or they end up having to resign from their position as head of an organization. Feminism has a multitude of disagreements within its big tents, so many that some have taken to using the word feminism to describe the movement. But the instinctive response to an outsider leveling criticism at any feminist or branch of feminism seems to be a powerful desire to circle the wagons against the external threat, to defend the label rather than disavow bigot censors or liars, or to refuse to examine how even their more mainstream ideas play a significant role in creating such people. It's not difficult to expose feminism for what it is. It's a set of unfalsifiable hypotheses that have no basis in, in, in empirical reality and which are about as effective as a coin toss in predicting what's going to happen. What is difficult is maintaining a venue from which to perform that exposition where others can see it. Feminists I mean, interested in silence, silencing people like me often employ community moderation processes and policies on social networking sites, processes that are often moder uh, automated to shut down the accounts of people that they don't like or to have their material removed. My YouTube channel is quite sizable. I put money in YouTube's pockets and generally they put a pair of human eyes on any case where I come under fire. But smaller channels uh, who are, are for whom the unfailing guarantee of freedom of expression is most important are not so lucky. I have heard many people in the gender debate say that if you're having to step down from your job or fear violent retaliation because of your ideas, that obviously means your ideas are invalid or bad or wrong or harmful. Tell that to Copernicus. Tell it to Galileo. 
Tell it to that dude who suggested washing your hands between handling a corpse and delivering a baby was probably a good idea because the medical establishment thought that he was a total quack for decades and shunned him accordingly. An idea needs to be open to challenge and scrutiny. It needs to be allowed to compete in a free marketplace. And yet so many feminists I've interacted with and other progressives seem to see George Orwell's 1984 not as a warning but as an instruction manual. <laughs> like you see, the only language that gets smaller every year, the body of ideas on a number of is issues in society is also in danger of getting smaller year by year, and word by word, bossy being the first one, for what I hear from Sheryl Sandberg, we're supposed to ban that word. And it's up to the political underdogs, not only to hold back the social and political forces that threaten to erode freedom of expression, despite guarantees into our constitutions and our charters of rights and freedoms, but to not go up our bait and switch and become the very thing we're fighting against if and when we become the dominant voice in society. 